The eyes, they say, are the windows to the soul. More practically, they're our window to the world, humans being one of many visually dependent species on the planet. But they are also fragile windows, susceptible to all sorts of injuries, diseases and disorders. Worldwide, over two billion people, nearly a third of the world's population, suffer from some sort of visual impairment, ranging from mild glaucoma and cataracts to complete blindness. Of these, 88.4 million suffer from mild, easily correctable, refractive errors such as nearsighted far-sightedness and astigmatism. For much of history, the only solution to such impairments was corrective lenses, but more recent years have seen the rise of advanced surgical corrective techniques such as LASIK. Thanks to such safe, quick, and relatively painless and inexpensive procedures, thousands of people are able to enjoy perfect vision without the hassle of glasses or contact lenses. But no technology appears fully formed overnight, and LASIK and its relatives owe their existence to a bizarre procedure developed in 1970 Soviet Russia, which involved an assembly line team of surgeons, diamond scalpels, and a rotating operating table looked more like a carnival ride than a piece of medical equipment. This is the story of radial keratotomy, the world's first successful corrective eye surgery. Eye surgery has been around since the dawn of civilization, the earliest description appearing in the Babylonian Code of Hammurabi from 1750 BCE. Among the oldest procedures on record is couching, used to correct cataracts or the progressive clouding of the lens. In couching, a metal or bone needle or even a sharp thorn is inserted into the eye and used to detach the cloudy lens and push it away from the pupil and down into the bottom of the eye. This allows light to enter the eye but leaves the patient unable to focus, requiring them to wear powerful corrective lenses to regain normal vision. This procedure spread throughout the ancient world, including to India, China, Egypt, Greece, and Rome, and is still performed today in certain parts of sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia, where modern medical practices are not widely available. Unfortunately, the success rate for couching is abysmal, with over 70% of patients suffering severe complications such as glaucoma, internal bleeding, infection, and inevitably complete vision loss. In 600 BC, pioneering Indian surgeon Shushruta developed a safer alternative to couching, a predecessor to the modern procedure of extracapsular cataract extraction. In this procedure, the cloudy lens itself was extracted while the lens capsule is left intact, leaving the patient with some residual focusing ability. In Sushrata's version, a needle was used to puncture the lens capsule, and the patient was instructed to pinch their nose shut and blow, increasing the pressure inside the eye and forcing the gelatinous lens material out of the incision. The eye was then bandaged and allowed to heal. This technique was further perfected in 1747 by French surgeon Jacques Darby and remains the standard surgery for correcting cataracts until the development of the implantable intraocular lens in the late 1940s. Whatever their advantages, all these early procedures required extreme skill on the part of the surgeon due to the eye's extreme sensitivity and tendency to move involuntarily during surgery. This problem persisted until 1884, when Austrian ophthalmologist Karl Koller discovered that a solution of cocaine could numb and immobilize the eyeball, making eye surgery much easier and safer. Yet, despite this advancement, eye surgery was only performed to treat severe injuries and disease. Eyeglasses remains the only effective means of treating mild refractive errors like near and far-sightedness. But all of this would change in the 1970s thanks to a maverick Soviet doctor. Sviatoslav Fyodorov was born in 1927 in the town of Proskurova, now Kamenetsky in Ukraine. Fyodorov grew up in grinding poverty, while in the 1930s during Stalin's Great Terror his father disappeared and was presumed to have been executed. He had in fact been sent to a Siberian labor camp and would not be reunited with his son in until 1995. From an early age, Fyodorov learned to be a pilot, and upon graduating from high school, enrolled at the preparatory aviation school in Yerevan. Unfortunately, his dreams of flight came to an abrupt end in 1945, when he lost a foot in a flying accident. Fyodorov thus switched to a career in medicine, graduating from the Medical Institute in Rostov-on-Don in 1957. After specializing in ophthalmology in 1957, he accepted a position as head of the Cheboksary branch of the State Institute of Eye Diseases. Over the following decade, Fyodorov worked in dozens of hospitals across Russia, but soon grew bored of standard ophthalmic practice and transitioned into research, hoping to help the greatest number of people regain their sight. In 1966, Fyodorov founded the Intraocular Implant Club, an international group devoted to the study of implantable synthetic lenses for the treatment of cataracts. The group's president was Sir Harold Ridley, the British surgeon who had developed and implanted the first such lens in 1949. Based on ideas discussed by the group, in 1966, Fyodorov developed the 
Fyodor of Zakharov Sputnik lens, the first to feature iris clips to hold the lens more firmly in place. Fyodorov's design caused fewer post-operative complications than earlier lenses and seemed poised to revolutionize the field of cataract treatments. Unfortunately, this advancement was strongly resisted by the Soviet authorities, who viewed the new procedure as unnatural and anti-physiological. As Fyodorov recalled in 1995 in an interview, I had to struggle for this matter. I was opposed by all the professors in Russia and the Soviet Union. I broke medical canons by introducing new technology, and those who violate canons are revolutionaries, pioneers. If they emerge victorious, they become popular. Undeterred by such resistance, Fyodorov soldiered on, managing not only to get his revolutionary new lens accepted across the Soviet Union, but also to develop innovative new techniques for treating glaucoma and performing microsurgery. His greatest breakthrough, however, came in 1974, thanks to a fortunate accident. According to Fyodorov, in that year he treated a young boy who had fallen off his bicycle, smashing his eyeglasses and embedding shards of glass in both eyes. To remove the shards, Fyodorov made a series of radial incisions across the boy's corneas, like the spoke on a wheel. Curiously, once the boy's eyes had healed, Fyodorov discovered that his vision had actually improved since before the accident, and he now no longer needed glasses. Fyodorov quickly determined what had happened. The boy suffered from myopia, or nearsightedness, caused by an excess curvature of the eye. As Fyodorov's incisions healed, the cornea had flattened, reducing this curvature and correcting the boy's vision. Fyodorov immediately realized the implications of this discovery and set about developing what would become the world's first successful and popular corrective vision surgery, which he dubbed radial keratotomy, or ARK. Hey. While Fyodorov would recount this anecdote many times over his long career, it is doubtful the incident occurred quite as Fyodorov remembered it, or that it was his only inspiration for developing RK. Indeed, nearly the same technique had already been invented some 40 years before by Japanese ophthalmologist Sutomo Sato. Unlike Fyodorov, Sato was inspired not by an injury, but by a degenerative disease called keratoconus, in which the cornea gets progressively thinner over time. This results in a flattening of the eyeball and consequent improvement in visual acuity in certain patients suffering from myopia. Based on this observation, Sato developed a technique very similar to Fyodorov's, which he first tested out on military pilots in 1939. Sato performed the procedure on thousands of Japanese citizens until the late 1950s, when the increasing availability of effective and affordable contact lenses led to corrective surgery falling out of favor in Japan. This turned out to be a blessing in disguise, for within a few years of undergoing the procedure, nearly 70% of Sato's patients began suffering serious complications, such as bulbous keratin in which large bullae or blisters form on the cornea. These complications resulted from Sato making incisions on both the front and back of the cornea, damaging a layer of cells known as the corneal endothelium. The failure of Sato's original procedure is cited as a major reason for the low popularity of refractive surgery in Japan. In 2003, only 48,000 refractive procedures were performed in Japan, compared to 1.4 million in the United States, a difference of nearly 30-fold, despite the country's two populations differing by by only a factor of two. Fyodorov's RK procedure, by contrast, avoided the risks of Sato's technique by only making incisions on the outside surface of the epithelium of the cornea, leaving the endothelium undamaged. In the refined procedure, between 4 to 32 radial cuts were made from pupil to the outside edge of the cornea using a special diamond-bladed scalpel of Fyodorov's own design. Far more innovative than Fyodorov's surgical refinements, however, was the manner in which the surgery was performed. Believing that beautiful eyes are for everyone, Fyodor of used assembly line techniques to bring industrial efficiency to the operating room. Anesthetized patients were placed on a conveyor belt-like operating table which slid on steel rails through a door at one end of the operating theater. The table then swung between 16 stations, each managed by a different surgeon. Each surgeon performed a single precision cut before the table swung to the next station, the whole procedure being supervised by a chief surgeon from an observation room overlooking the operating theater. While some surgeons balked at being reduced to mere factory workers, the assembly line technique significantly reduced the risks of mistakes and allowed the RK procedure to be performed in as little as 15 minutes. This way, up to 40 patients could be treated in a single shift. Another of Fyodorov's innovations was the business model used to bring RK to the masses. In 1986, he founded the Research Institute of Eye Microsurgery in Moscow. Incredibly, despite Russia being staunchly communist, the institute was run as a semi-private institution, allowing it to offer competitive wages to its employees and expand its activities across the globe. Through the institute, Fyodorov built dozens of factory-style microsurgery clinics across Russia, in foreign countries including Italy, Poland, Germany, Spain, Cuba, Yemen, and the United Arab Emirates, and even aboard a specially modified ship, the Peter I, which sailed from port to port, offering RK to wealthy clients. 
Money from these plants in turn partially subsidized RK surgeries for Soviet citizens, making the procedure cheaper than buying eyeglasses. But reaching this point was an uphill battle, for the Soviet bureaucracy initially resisted Fyodorov's vision. All of this changed, however, with the election of Soviet Premier Mikhail Gorbachev in 1985. As Fyodorov later recalled, Gorbachev, he understood immediately. That's why everything which I asked, I received. Still, many in the Soviet establishment saw Fyodorov as a shameless self-promoter and viewed his pseudo-capitalist business model with suspicion. Yet, whatever their ideological views, few could deny that Fyodorov's methods were effective. By the 1990s, Fyodorov's clinics were performing nearly 27,000 surgeries every year, with most patients being discharged the same day that they were admitted. The Institute in Moscow attracted top surgical talent from around the world, eager to learn Fyodorov's cutting-edge techniques, developed advanced artificial lenses and corneas, and did a brisk trade selling surgical equipment to India and China. As Emilia Resnick, an ophthalmologist at Fyodorov's Moscow clinic in the early 1980s, explained, he was one of the first in Russia to understand that publicity made prosperity. And I would say, my own opinion, he didn't do it for anything else. He just wanted to get rid of those waiting lines for the surgery. Indeed, Fyodorov had long been an avowed critic of communist ideology, stating in 1990, I believe a man without property is half crippled. He is half slave and half hireling. He who has nothing to leave his children is a homeless outcast. We have been living according to the principle of equality and poverty and uniform ideology. People have been living like a faceless mass in which the personality is completely lost. For 72 years, we have been advocating false values. Thanks to his shrewd business practice, following the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, Fyodorov became one of the new Russia's first millionaires. In that year, Russian President Boris Yeltsin invited Fyodorov to become Prime Minister. Though Fyodorov turned down the offer, he did form his own political party, the Party of Workers' Self-Government, and ran in the 1996 Russian presidential election. He was ultimately defeated, but served in the Duma or Parliament from 1996 to 1999. Never losing his boyhood passion for flight in 2000, the 72-year-old Fyodorov obtained his helicopter license. Tragically, his previous bad luck came back to haunt him, and on June the 2nd of that year, he was killed in a helicopter crash on the outskirts of Moscow, along with three other people. But while Fyodorov was undoubtedly a giant in the field of refractive eye surgery, bringing affordable corrective procedure to the masses, the technique he pioneered ultimately did not stand the test of time. Just like Tsutomu Sato's procedure decades before, RK proved unstable, with over 40% of patients experiencing a gradual degradation in their vision within 10 years of undergoing the procedure, as well as other complications such as epithelial plugs and bacterial infections. Thankfully, by the early 2000s, RK had been rendered nearly obsolete by more sophisticated techniques needs such as LASIK, which harnessed the power and precision of lasers. LASIK has its origins in a procedure known as Carato Meloisis, developed by Spanish-born Colombian ophthalmologist Dr. Jose Baraka in the 1960s. Like Fyodorov's radical keratotomy procedure, Carato Meloisis was developed largely by accident. In the late 1950s, Baraka performed a corneal treatment on a patient suffering from keratoconus, the degenerative disease mentioned previously in this video. The transplant flattened the patient's cornea, effectively correcting their nearsightedness. Inspired by this finding, over the next several years, Baraka developed the keratomalysis technique in which a highly precise oscillating diamond blade known as a microkeratome was used to cut a circular flap in the outer layer of the epithelium of the cornea. The flap was opened and a tiny brush used to re-sculpt and flatten the underlying endothelium layer. The flap was then replaced and the cornea allowed to heal. The first keratomalysis procedure was performed in 1963, while the first course in the procedure was held at the Baraka Institute in Bogota in 1977. However, it would take a breakthrough in laser technology for the technique to truly take off. In 1980, IBM engineer Rangaswamy Srinivasan developed the ultraviolet Excima laser, which was initially used for etching printed circuit boards. Then, in one of those moments so absurd it seems almost inevitable, over Thanksgiving dinner in 1981, Srinivasan and his colleague Samuel Blum and James Wynne speculated that the Excima laser could be used to precisely etch human tissues. The trio proceeded to test the hypothesis by unleashing their expensive new piece of equipment on the remains of their Thanksgiving turkey. They discovered that the laser was indeed capable of making extremely precise incisions in tissue, leaving no thermal damage on the periphery of the cut. Four years later, these findings came to the attention of researcher Stephen Trockel at Columbia University, who immediately recognized the potential of the Excima laser for use in eye surgery. Trockel experimented with using the Excima laser to reshape the eyes of human cadavers,
Rabbiters and later Live Rabbits and Monkeys, publishing his findings in 1985. Two years later, one of Trocker's colleagues, Marguerite MacDonald, used his findings to develop the world's first laser-based corrective eye surgery procedure known as photorefractive keratectomy, or PRK. In PRK, a fine brush was used to scrape away the corneal epithelium, exposing the endothelium beneath. An excimer laser was then used to carve away and flatten the endothelium. A soft contact lens then is placed over the eye and the epithelium allowed to naturally regenerate. This typically took around 72 hours, during which period the patient would experience slightly blurry vision and mild eye pain. In 1988, McDonald became the first surgeon to perform a successful PRK procedure. She was also the first to correct farsightedness with lasers in 1993 and to perform the Epi LASIK procedure in 2003, and later became the first female president of the American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery and the International Society of Refractive Surgery. In 1990, Dr. Loanis Pelicaris of Greece and Dr. Lucio Barato of Italy combined McDonald's technique with Jose Baraka's microkeratome to create a procedure known as LASIK. Laser assisted in situ keratomilosis or LASIK. In LASIK, a microkeratome is used to cut a circular flap in the cornea, as in regular keratomilosis, while the endothelium is reshaped using an excimer laser, such as in PRK. By making smaller incisions and allowing the cornea to act as its own natural bandage, LASIK resulted in less discomfort and shorter recovery times than earlier techniques. LASIK was approved for commercial use in Canada in 1991 and in the United States in 1995, and quickly became the most popular refractive surgery in the world with over 40 million procedures being performed worldwide between 1991 and 2016. However, the older PRK procedure is still regularly performed on patients with corneas too thin or abnormally shaped for regular LASIK. LASIK itself is also continuously evolving, with various refinements and variations being developed over the years. Among those is laser-assisted epithelial keratomyolysis, or LASIK, developed by Dimitri Azar in 1996. LASIK is similar to classical PRK in that the corneal epithelium is scraped away rather rather than cut as a flap. However, the epithelium is first softened using a diluted alcohol solution and the cells brushed back into place at the end of the surgery, allowing for faster recovery times. A related procedure is epilasic, in which most of the epithelium is removed except for a thin flap that is left in place to promote healing. By dispensing with the alcohol, epilasic reduces the risk of nerve damage and is superior for use on dry eyes, while the thin epithelial bandage avoids the risk of corneal flap detachment associated with regular LASIK. But perhaps the most significant significant advancement in laser eye surgery is eye LASIK, an all-laser procedure in which the mechanical microkeratome is replaced with a femtosecond excimer laser. This procedure, which is more precise and results in less discomfort and shorter recovery times than traditional LASIK, is now the preferred refractive surgery technique worldwide. Though refractive eye surgery has come a long way since the days of Fyodorov's strange turntable operating theaters, the basic principles and the goals and ambitions of all eye surgeons remain the same. As Fyodorov stated in a speech delivered hours before his death, we must make people's life better so that they can see well, so that they will be comfortable in this clinic, so that they can live well all over our country. This is the goal that unites all of us. This is a wonderful goal.